The following is an HDNet original presentation. Tonight, all is not forgiven. Shocking revelations of a priest's dark past and the lives he shattered. Could it all have been prevented? The Archdiocese knew that they should not believe the word of a potential predator. They should always err on the side of protecting kids, and that's something they did not do. Also, plastic, plastic everywhere. A vast sea of garbage lurking in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We're just now really starting to delve into this in detail, and we have no idea what the long-term effects on this ecosystem have been. And a brave new world at work. The high-tech job crunch from the point of view of a foreign worker. I'm doing the same stuff as this guy, but I'm making 50% less than what this guy's making. That's when you start thinking about, uh, hey, do I need to work for this company or do I need to move on? We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Report. Good evening from Los Angeles. When the priest's sex abuse of children scandal exploded nearly 10 years ago, the Roman Catholic Church promised a new era of no tolerance. Perhaps no one was publicly more contrite than Cardinal Roger Mahoney, who until recently was the leader of the Los Angeles Archdiocese. But tonight, a Dan Rather Reports investigation reveals new evidence of a disturbing gulf between words and action. As it turns out, while Cardinal Mahoney was promising sweeping new reforms, his archdiocese welcomed a priest with a dark and not so hidden past to this parish. As a result, more lives were ruined. This is not make-belief. You know, it's not something I made up. It's not something I woke up one morning and, and, and decided, okay, today I'm gonna say I got molested by a priest. This is something that took place. This is something that affected me as a child and it's gonna affect me for the rest of my life. This young man is listed as John V.G. Doe in a lawsuit against the Los Angeles Archdiocese. He asked to remain anonymous because of the nature of the crime against him. As a teenage student at St. Thomas the Apostle Catholic School just outside downtown LA, he was repeatedly molested by a popular priest named Father Fernando Lopez Lopez. Well, tell me how you first came to know Father Lopez. I was going to St. Thomas the Apostle School, you know, and I had seen him around a few times, you know, and I met him, I actually got into contact with him in confession, during confession, that's when I met him. Did you like him? Yeah, he seemed like a nice person at first. I know how difficult it is to talk about what most people would consider unspeakable things, but when did you begin to lose trust in him? You know, uh, truthfully, when we were driving around and he started uh, touching me where he wasn't supposed to be touching me, you know? That's when I started, I started kind of like wondering, you know? Did you resist, did you protest? I did at first. You know, I, I pushed his hands away, I, I, but I never really questioned it, you know. I was raised to believe that I'm supposed to trust a priest, I'm mm. supposed to listen, you know what I'm saying? This is the person I go to confession and tell all my sins to, so how can this person be doing something wrong? Right. What's notable about this case is that the Los Angeles Archdiocese assigned Father Lopez to work with the children of St. Thomas the Apostle in 2001. That was a time when the world, and the Vatican itself, was coming to grips with the unimaginable scale of decades of sex abuse by Catholic priests and cover-ups by their superiors. In Los Angeles, the church was, at least privately, acknowledging it had a problem. In March 2002, an explosive series of articles in the Los Angeles Times detailed widespread priest abuse in the Archdiocese and ultimately forced Cardinal Mahoney to address his parishioners. We acknowledge our mistakes and 
and our role in that suffering, and we apologize and take responsibility for too often failing victims and our people in the past. Cardinal Mahoney has since become a central figure in the sex abuse scandal. As a bishop in Central California in the 1980s, he had shuffled known abusive priests from parish to parish. And under his leadership as cardinal, the Los Angeles Archdiocese agreed to pay more than 500 victims a record $660 million. It should be noted that some of the victims had been molested long before Mahoney's tenures as cardinal and bishop. When the cardinal retired in February, he and his archdiocese were the subject of at least two investigations. Lord, protect us in our struggle against evil. Still widely respected, indeed revered by many Catholics and others for his good works over the years, Mahoney has never been charged with any crime. There's no wiggle room. I, I can't take a chance that someone uh, who may have been guilty or was guilty may uh, uh, abuse a child again. I can't take the chance. But even as Cardinal Mahoney was assuring the public that the church now had a zero tolerance approach to abusive priests, at St. Thomas the Apostle Parish, those assurances did nothing to stop Father Lopez from preying on teenage boys. Lopez was eventually arrested and in 2005 convicted of molesting John V.G. Doe, now 22, and two other minors. The priest served three years in prison, was eventually stripped of his priesthood, and in 2008 was deported to his home country of Colombia. But our investigation has uncovered disturbing new evidence that Lopez should never have been entrusted with children in Los Angeles. Even if you're hiring a janitor to work in the school, you're going to find out where he worked, who he worked with, you're going to fingerprint the person, you're going to do a background check. They did very little checks on this person, this Father Lopez, and for what reasons I really... Attorney Vince Finaldi is representing John V. G. Doe in his lawsuit against the Archdiocese, set to go to trial in October. Finaldi's client alleges that Los Angeles church officials, led by Cardinal Mahoney, ignored or disregarded several warning signs about Lopez's past. And why was Lopez placed here? Uh, well, uh, the community here is actually primarily El Salvadoran, mm -hmm. large El Salvadoran population. Um, so being from Colombia, he spoke the language, uh, he knew the culture, and for that reason I believe they thought he was a good fit for this area. The complaint alleges that Lopez had a history of abusing boys in his care before he ever came to Los Angeles and was able to continue because of a, quote, conspiracy of silence. Finaldi says that other than knowing that Father Lopez was a priest, the archdiocese did not do nearly enough to check his background. He showed up unannounced with no letter from his bishop, and he said, hey, I want to be a priest here. And that's really not the way it works. Well, wait a minute. Help me help the viewers understand here. Sure. He shows up in this archdiocese in effect on the doorstep? Yes. Saying I'm a priest, does he yes. have credentials he can show? Or? Well, he had some, uh, I believe he had some paperwork, mm -hmm. you know, but how does the archdiocese know that the paperwork's accurate? Mm -hmm. Our position is the only way to do that is either to send someone to where he was from and inquire as to his training, or to receive his actual records, his seminary records, his personnel records, or to at the very least call someone on the phone and talk to him. And they didn't do any of these. The story of Lopez and his abuse of teenage boys extends far beyond this hard scrabble neighborhood. To understand why this case is so explosive for the Los Angeles Archdiocese, you have to travel halfway around the globe. Welcome to Tivoli, Italy, just outside of Rome. This is a close-knit working class community where the biggest employer is the famed Travertine Quarries. Stone dug from here was used to build the colonnade at St. Peter's Square at the Vatican. It was known to the Los Angeles Archdiocese that Tivoli was where Lopez spent his first years as a priest, but church documents uncovered by Finaldi and his legal team suggested that there had been allegations of homosexual involvement with youth group members during his time here. Please drive to highlighted route. So Finaldi recently came to Italy to get some answers. 
what we, we do is we drive to the village and uh, kind of get a survey of it and then park and walk around and start talking to people. And that's basically the only way to do it is knocking on doors and canvassing the area. Getting information about such a sensitive topic isn't easy here. You want to go talk to the old ladies a little bit? So Finaldi brought his father, Ennio, who was born in Italy, to serve as an interpreter and help break the ice. Why don't you go talk to him a little bit? The villages here are the same as they have been for decades, devout and reverent to the institution of the church and yeah. wary of outsiders. So she didn't hear about anything, right? No. Even near this church where Lopez served for about two years, it was hard to find anyone who would discuss the former priest on camera. And many in this church-going community implausibly said they didn't even remember him. No. But at the time, Father Fernando Lopez Lopez was celebrated around the area for his ability to connect with some of the neighborhood's most troubled teenagers. This is an article from a local paper about a disco he opened in the parish as an outreach effort. He'd go to the streets and go to the bars, go to the place where kids were hanging out, uh, the kids who either didn't have families or kids who had broken families. Um, and these are the kids that were actually the most vulnerable ones of the area here. Uh, if you're going to pick any kids to prey upon, it'd be those kids, the ones that don't have a lot of close family connections, the, the ones that don't have anywhere else to go. Father Lopez's disco was located here in the site of the Santa Maria del Popolo Church. And this is where allegations of Lopez's inappropriate behavior caught the attention of local church officials. Uh, some of the parishioners were saying that he was involved in illegal drug activities with the kids and also in uh, homosexual activity with the kids. And uh, it was emanating out of the bar here. Uh, we also learned uh, from one of the church officials that there were allegations of homosexual activity against Father Fernando dating all the way back to his time in the seminary in Rome. That information came to Finaldi's colleague, Patrick Wall, himself a former priest, who was in Tivoli just a few weeks before our visit. Wall says his source was Don Fabrizio Fantini, Father Lopez's former supervisor. Don Fabrizio is now the pastor of this beautiful cathedral in Tivoli. The big revelation from Don Fabrizio was he stated that he actually had a conversation with the Archdiocese of L.A. back in 2001 regarding Father Fernando Lopez Lopez. That's right. Finaldi says Don Fabrizio warned Los Angeles church officials of the allegations surrounding Lopez back in 2001. He said he fielded a phone call from the Archdiocese of Los Angeles where they asked questions about Father Lopez, uh, specifically regarding his experience here in Tivoli. And he stated that he did tell him, uh, he did tell the Archdiocese that uh, Father Fernando Lopez Lopez had been the subject of certain allegations of homosexual activity with the youth and drug activity with the youth. If true, this means that the Los Angeles Archdiocese would have had an opportunity to keep Father Lopez from transferring there. But Finaldi says when his colleague Patrick Wall tried to get Don Fabrizio to sign a declaration that could be entered into court documents, the priest refused. He stated that he had to go and talk to the bishop really quickly to make sure he had full authority to talk about this. He stayed uh, for about 45 minutes in another room and he came back and he said he's not allowed to continue the uh, conversation with us. We asked the Archdiocese to comment on the allegation that Don Fabrizio had reached out to Los Angeles. Their lawyer responded, quote, you should be careful about the statement attributed to Don Fabrizio Pantini. He confirmed to us that he never communicated to anyone connected with the Archdiocese of Los Angeles any concern at all about Fernando Lopez Lopez. He also confirmed that he never told the plaintiff's representatives anything to the contrary, end quote. After trying to track down Don Fabrizio ourselves for several days, 
Our reporters finally reached him by telephone, and he also denied to us being contacted by Los Angeles. Perché Peppe Tual ci aveva detto che era stato molto che aveva collaborato con lui e che gli aveva dato delle informazioni utili. Pronto? Va bene. Grazie, Lady. We would have loved to have known a lot more than we knew about this priest before we got it, before we got him, but we didn't. When we return, we go back to Los Angeles where the Archdiocese responds. If there were any reservations about Father Fernando Lopez Lopez by his superiors in Italy, you won't find them in the official paper trail. Letters filed in the lawsuit show Tivoli's then bishop, Pietro Garlato, and others assuring the Los Angeles Archdiocese that Lopez had a clean track record with children. And that's important because he was assigned to work closely with children. But shortly before applying for a post in Los Angeles, Lopez has set off alarm bells in another Southern California diocese. According to this letter we obtained, Lopez first approached church officials in San Bernardino, California, about transferring to the United States. But they were suspicious about why Lopez would want to leave a coveted post in Italy. Father Lopez Lopez uh, arrived in San Bernardino unannounced and he told the number two person in charge of the diocese, who was the vicar for clergy, that he would like to work there. He came from Italy. And during the interview, Father Lopez admitted that he had had sexual misconduct allegations lodged against him. And he said they were all young adults uh, over the age of 18. He said the allegation was also that he was involved with drug activity with the youth. During the interview, Father Lopez denied the allegations. But for San Bernardino, aware of the swelling priest abuse scandal, it was enough to disqualify Lopez. We wanted to ask the Los Angeles Archdiocese how Lopez wound up in California. Church officials agreed to let us talk to their lawyer, Mike Hennigan. When he and his team arrived, they told us we had 15 minutes for our questions. So is it or is it not your position that the Archdiocese vetted him? Absolutely, they did. Uh, in, in writing, we, we have it signed, sealed, and and uh, with uh, the official stamp on it from the Diocese of Tivoli that, that there was absolutely no moral problems with this priest. Then explain to me the what I'll call the San Bernardino part of the case. Well, it, that's one of the strange sides of this story is um, Father Lopez arrived at, this, at San Bernardino a little less than a month before he came to us. Uh, when they went through the same process that we went through, the home bishop gave San Bernardino like he did with us a statement that there was no, no problem with this priest, but in the letter to San Bernardino, there's another couple of sentences in that letter, and it said, however, there have been rumors about this priest um, in terms of his drug abuse and homosexual involvement with young people, although not children. Um, we didn't get that part of the letter. Three years later, San Bernardino church officials heard Lopez was working here in Los Angeles and wrote a letter cautioning the archdiocese. But again, true or untrue, you tell me, that the leaders in San Bernardino let the archdiocese of Los Angeles know once they found out that Father Lopez was here and was engaged with children. Three years later. Mm -hmm. Three years later. And you put emphasis on that because? Because for three years, since we'd gotten a clean bill of health from, from Bishop Garlato in, in Tivoli, uh, he had been working at St. Thomas uh, here successfully. We'd had no complaints with him about him. He'd been a popular priest. And so when we got the same letter that San Bernardino got, they got to make a decision at the outset about whether they wanted to deal with these rumors or not. When we got it, we were uh, dealing with a priest who'd been successful here. So we began a further investigation. Attorney Finaldi wonders why the Archdiocese of Los Angeles placed Lopez with children after receiving nothing more than what amounted to a letter of recommendation from his former supervisor in Italy. 
the first thing that any reasonable person would do is they'd call up the place where the person worked before, whether it be in any kind of employment position, uh, and, and find out what the person's past was. I mean, that's, that's just background checks 101. So either they didn't do that and they were completely inept in their background check, or they did do it and they lied. Either way, Finaldi says, it's Cardinal Mahoney who bears responsibility for Lopez's transfer to the Archdiocese of L.A. It's a hierarchical structure where there's one person in charge of the entire archdiocese, and at the time period, it was Cardinal Mahoney. He is the one person who makes all the decisions. Uh, he's the ultimate authority and decision maker. It's no secret that the church is having difficulty with this issue. A priest arrives on the doorstep, you write the bishop, and you, you take that at face value? Absolutely, absolutely, and, and, and we would do that today. If there's, if there's no reason to suspect then this is a solemn process. When we, when we get an affirmation from the bishop, he is saying, and, and this is the bishop that, that ordained him, this is the bishop that, where he's been for years, he says, I know nothing about this priest that would suggest that he was inappropriate for children, nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And so, of course we would. We did and we would, until we, until we had reason to investigate. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Today, with the no tolerance policy in effect, and it's been in effect for quite some time. Yes, it has. That you wouldn't go to the police records? You wouldn't go to the criminal records? In a situation like this, I don't think so. And until there's reason to suspect it, as long as we've got an affirmation from somebody who we think knows him well, and would know anything about him, from rumors to, to actual uh, criminal activity, absolutely. And this faith in the bishop's word as the only form of background check seems to be what went wrong in the Lopez case. We wanted to know if there was anything suspicious about Father Lopez in the public record, so our reporting team looked into whether he had a file in Rome's criminal court, and we made a startling discovery. According to a court official, court records on file in Italy show that Lopez was arrested in this medieval town outside Rome about a year before his transfer to Los Angeles. His charge? Repeated sexual violence on a minor. Lopez pleaded guilty to avoid jail time. Well, Counselor, I have a problem, and I, I want you to explain uh, as, as best you can how it is that when we checked the criminal records, it was very clear that he had pled guilty uh, to doing things he shouldn't have done with children. Now, as a journalistic enterprise, if we can do that with one phone call, why couldn't or why didn't the church do that? Well, we, we follow a process that's worked very successfully for a long period of time, which is to get a solemn affirmation from the per people who know him the best. And, of course, there's language issues and things like that. But when we got it, it was completely clean. So we, we thought it was not necessary to go any further than that. This, this is what you got from the bishop in Italy? In 2001, that's correct. Well, surely you see my point, that it, most people would not consider that anything close to uh, an investigation of a priest who, after all, and correct me if I'm wrong, had sort of showed up on the doorstep uh, applying to be a priest in the archdiocese. You know, our, our position then and now is if there's reason to further investigate, we do. Uh, in this case, we didn't have a reason to further investigate because we got this absolutely pristine recommendation from his bishop. Of course, looking back today, looking over events that we now know happened here, uh, we would have loved to have known a lot more than we knew about this priest before we got it, before we got here, but we didn't. By comparison, most school districts in the United States require employees with even limited exposure to children to undergo background checks. The fact that one priest came to Los Angeles with allegations of suspicious behavior left out of his official record raises questions about whether the archdiocese system for vetting priests is, to say the least, stringent enough. Are you following the same protocol today that you followed in 2002 when uh, the father first arrived here? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I suspect so, but I don't know. Right. Well, I want to go back to, to the moment when it could have been prevented. You made the point before, what well, could have, should have, might have. But again, given the context of the times, does it strike you as strange or unusual 
that with so many cases of sexual child abuse among priests, that somebody didn't make a simple phone call, didn't check the criminal record of this person, didn't, didn't check out something other than taking the bishop's word for it? In this context, I think not. I mean, remember that we've got not only time zone issues, but we've also got language barriers. And so it, we find that it's better to deal across those kinds of boundaries in writing, and, and we then take the writing and decide whether or not there's anything to follow up based upon what we got. And as I said, we got a complete, clean bill of health from Bishop Garlato. But the victim's attorney, Vince Finaldi, says the priest abuse scandal has shown that bishops can be unreliable. And depending only on their word and a job interview with a priest is not nearly enough scrutiny. When we talked to the Archdiocese of Los Angeles about it, Monsignor Cox, who's the number two person in charge, he admitted that he received the letter and he read it and he gave it to his assistant, who was Monsignor Gonzalez, and said, look into this. Monsignor Gonzalez took the letter, put it on his desk, and essentially did nothing for three months. The Archdiocese knew that they should not believe the word of a potential predator. They should always err on the side of protecting kids, and that's something they did not do. According to church records, Father Lopez was not put on administrative leave until more than four months after the Archdiocese began looking into the allegations in Tivoli. The victim suing the Archdiocese said Lopez continued abusing him during some of that time. Well, how does the abuse affect your life now, or does it affect it? Yes, it affects my relationships, you know, my job. You know, I don't think I'll ever be able to hold a normal relationship with anybody. You know, one moment I'm okay, and then the next moment I'm thinking of my past, and, and I'm depressed, and I want to die. You know, um, last night um, I was thinking about doing this interview, you know, and um, I was crying. You know, I was thinking about I haven't had any good luck in life. Life has dealt me some messed up cards. You know, and um, sometimes I think if I had a choice whether to be dead or to be alive, I'd be dead. You know, if I knew that I could go and um, my family wouldn't hurt or wouldn't struggle, then I'd be better off dead, you know? You must have tried, or did you, to get it out of your mind, to just seal it off? Yes, I tried that for many years and it worked for a period of time, but eventually it hits you. Well, I want to share with you some new information, mm -hmm. uh, information we've dug up in our investigation. Our reporting team went to Italy, where Father Lopez was originally made a priest, and they learned that Father Lopez had been arrested and he pleaded guilty to molesting a teenager there back in 2000, before he came to Los Angeles. Did you know that? No, I did not. How do you feel about that? Oh, it, it makes me sick to my stomach. You know, um, I mean, they should have put a stop to it there and then. You know, he should have never been ab uh, able to still be a priest. You know, it isn't right, you know, and it, it scares me to think that they wouldn't stop it, you know, that they would just move him to Los Angeles and try to cover it up. You know, it just makes me think of how many other victims there were. Well, now that you know, and I've told you, I'm going to ask you again a question I asked you before. Based on this information, this new information to you, who do you think, other than Father Lopez, is responsible for your abuse? The Archdiocese, you know, the Catholic religion, the, the people in charge, you know. They should have put a stop to it. They should have corrected it. They shouldn't have allowed it to keep happening. Can you imagine yourself going back to the church, reconciling with the church? I, I, I don't find no need for it. You know, I have a relationship with God and that's all that matters. 
you know, I don't need to go and bow down to, uh, to another man. You know what I'm saying? My relationship with God, it's good enough. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever go back to the church. The Archdiocese lawyer, Mike Hennigan, feels strongly that Cardinal Mahoney has gotten a bad rap. He says Mahoney implemented new protocols that will remove a priest as soon as any allegations of abuse surface. And it's important to note that it was Mahoney who ultimately signed the letter calling for Lopez to be stripped of his priesthood. Hennigan says Mahoney should also be remembered for his tireless advocacy for immigrants and the poor. As far as Fernando Lopez Lopez is concerned, he is now reportedly in Colombia, and Fernaldi says the ex-priest continues to send emails to some of his former parishioners in Italy. Now, when we return, we take you on a trip to a sea of trash in the Pacific Ocean. So stay here with us. And now, a journey to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We had the rare opportunity to accompany a voyage headed to a spot on the globe more than 1,000 miles from the nearest land. It's a place hardly ever visited by people, but human activity is still having a big impact. Decades worth of trash carried by powerful ocean currents has found its way to this remote area. And although it's an immense problem, you'll see why it so easily goes unnoticed. After taking on crew and provisions, the brigantine sailboat Kaisei leaves port in San Francisco and heads out into the open ocean. The 20 people aboard won't see land until they return to California in three weeks. They're not likely to see any other people either. Where they're headed, ships occasionally pass, but almost never linger. It's called the Eastern Garbage Patch, an enormous and remote stretch of water where an alarming amount of man-made trash has been quietly accumulating for decades. The problem is it's sort of out of sight, out of mind, and that's one reason why it's important for us to go out there and not only work at cleanup, but work at documenting so people see that it's our trash and it doesn't just disappear. Mary Crowley is a lifelong sailor and ocean advocate. Her nonprofit, Ocean Voyages Institute, owns the Kaisei and organized this expedition. <laughs> Crowley has recruited volunteers from all walks of life to help document the trash problem in the Pacific. Among them are college students and retirees, all concerned citizens willing to lend a hand. Nick Mallis is a project coordinator for Ocean Conservancy, a nonprofit geared toward protecting the world's oceans. He joined the crew as part of an international effort to remove garbage from beaches and waterways. I'm basically a glorified trash man. You know what? If that's going to put me on a sailboat in the middle of the ocean, I'm fine being a glorified trash man. Identifying those areas where we have massive amounts of debris is really crucial if we're going to try to initiate cleanup efforts and test various, uh, you know, cleanup solutions. The garbage collects within a huge system of circular ocean currents called the Northern Pacific Gyre. The gyre itself is almost inconceivably large, about three times the size of the continental United States. Its currents pick up debris from the coasts of Asia and North America, and some of that trash finds its way to an area of calm water midway between Hawaii and the coast of California, where it stays. The eastern garbage patch was discovered in 1997 and soon gained notoriety as an eighth continent, or a floating island of trash. It quickly got deemed the island of floating plastic. In, in the early goings, this is really great to attract public perception and interest, but unfortunately, that, that perception of it just being a solid block of trash is really, really um, inaccurate. 
After a week of sailing, the Kaisei arrives at what looks at first glance like any other stretch of ocean. We're in it. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we yeah, got a current a line. There's a current line here that has a heavier perfusion of garbage pieces in it. Lots of Yeah, we can pieces. see it. It's running way off. It might be worth it once the dinghy. Hey, Give it some gas. You got a ways to go. Off our starboard. Off our starboard a bit. It is here. 1,200 miles from the nearest land that they start to see trash in the water. And we have like a green bottle cap. There are a few large pieces of garbage floating on the surface, but the majority of the trash takes a more insidious form. When we are on the dinghy, just being right on the water, you see there's just millions and millions of little fragments of plastic. Over time, plastic trash breaks down into smaller and smaller fragments. The result is a soup of plastic particles stretching for thousands of square miles, some of it visible, but much of it hidden from view. And as the plastic deteriorates, it may be leaching toxic chemicals into the water. Plastic is the real problem out here. While some objects float on the surface of the water, the majority of the marine debris that we're finding out here sits within the top meter or two meters of the water column submerged, so it's extremely difficult to even spot them. Crowley and her team aren't here to conduct a scientific survey. Instead, they are bearing witness to a problem that they feel is too easily ignored. That's what we got, eh? I would say right now it's about 200 yards. They keep a running tally of every piece of garbage they see, and soon it numbers in the many thousands. Right now we have 1,307 large objects entered into our database, as well as roughly 18,000 small pieces, for the most part one inch in diameter or less, that float on the surface of the water. This is just a tiny microcosm of what's really out here. The crew also collects the larger pieces of plastic to bring back to land. Another motor oil container, still really firm, broken in a little bit, but you see here, these fragments just become so brittle. And these are the little pieces that turn into those little, little millimeter pieces. Those are the things that really pose the greatest threat. Most likely, these are land-based, probably entered the water five to six years ago and just slowly made their way around the, the various currents until they centralized here in the high pressure gyre. Researchers don't know how much trash is out here, or even the true size of the affected area, other than they know it's huge. But the key question is exactly how all this plastic will impact the ocean ecosystem. The largest pieces of trash have the most obvious effects. Discarded nets trap and kill fish. Sea turtles suffocate when they mistake plastics for prey. Sea birds feed bottle caps to their young, which block their digestion and eventually kill them. But less is known about the effect of the millions of tiny pieces of plastic. Three fish all in that motor oil bucket. Can you see in this fish's mouth? This fish has tons of plastic in its mouth. In addition to releasing potentially dangerous chemicals, plastics can also absorb toxic pollutants from the surrounding water. As the plastic particles enter the food chain, scientists fear that those toxins will poison wildlife. They could even end up in the seafood we eat. We're just now really starting to delve into this in detail, and we have no idea what the long-term effects on this ecosystem have been. Very few people realize that these are our garbage, you know, that it comes from the watersheds of cities and towns all over the world. We just have to stop the flow of this into the ocean, but we also have to get out here and clean it up. But many experts say cleaning up the garbage patch is impossible, like trying to remove confetti from a vast desert. A lot of people say that cleaning up 
decent garbage patch is a waste of resources or it's unrealistic and unfeasible. But the truth is, um, it doesn't hurt to explore the possibility. But while cleanup methods could take place, the real problem starts on land. And according to most experts, the real solution to this problem also starts on land, preventing trash from entering the ocean in the first place. After three weeks at sea, the Kaisei returns to shore in San Diego. It's Labor Day weekend, and a lively waterfront festival is underway. The Kaisei is here to show off its catch. It's a chance for visitors to see where their trash may be ending up. The crew hopes that when people come face to face with what could be their own garbage, they'll give some thought to the millions of tons of plastic that's consumed and discarded every year. And the North Pacific isn't the only place where high concentrations of plastic are showing up. Garbage patches have been found in oceans all over the world. Welcome back. And now, more in our continuing series on the foreign workforce in America. It's a workforce that business leaders and lawmakers say this country needs to compete and create jobs. These workers are brought here legally on a federal work visa system that is especially controversial today because millions of our fellow citizens are out of work. Two weeks ago on this program, we brought you the stories of four American tech workers who say this corporate visa system isn't creating jobs, it's undercutting American workers. This is not fair. I want a chance to compete for a job in my own country. They think that it's cheaper to bring in guest workers. I'm not suggesting they did anything illegal. I'm just suggesting what they are doing is, is hurting this country. Tonight, we're going to get a glimpse of this corporate visa system from a very different perspective. My name is uh, Shashi Raj Jariputula, and uh, Raj is my short name. Uh, everyone calls me Raj. Raj is a software engineer in Santa Clara, California, where he lives with his wife and two kids. He recently invited us to spend a Saturday with him and his family. My son, he has drawn a passion for computers right now, so he, uh, when he gets elder, uh, maybe at a later age, he, he said that he would like to become uh, very much a software engineer like me. My daughter wants to become a veterinary doctor. Raj came to this country six years ago on what's known as an H-1B visa, designed for highly skilled workers. Akshay, got your belts on? The idea is that when companies want to attract the world's best and brightest talent to America, they first bring them into the country using H-1B visas and put them on the path to citizenship. I was born in India. Uh, I did my education in India. I had a bachelor's uh, in chemical engineering from India. Raj made the jump from chemicals to computers during the dot-com boom of the mid-90s. I take uh, pride in what I'm doing and I have a passion for what I do. Anyone in software engineering, uh, Silicon Valley is a dream uh, to come and work in Silicon Valley. And in the world of high tech, Silicon Valley is the center of the universe. It's estimated that foreign born entrepreneurs founded more than one third of the Valley's high tech startups. And thousands of immigrants who have settled here first arrived as H-1B visa workers like Raj. Of the tens of thousands of new H-1B workers brought into the country every year, nearly half are from India. America has always been a kaleidoscope of cultures, a place of huddled masses and wide-eyed dreamers. And now we're seeing an influx of high-skilled newcomers like never before especially from Asia. The 2010 census shows that the number of people of Indian descent living in the U.S. has increased nearly 70% in the past decade, more than almost any other ethnic group. 
But for H-1B workers like Raj, the path to permanent status, the coveted green card, means navigating a dizzying maze of red tape. It is a very long and uncertain journey. It's estimated that some people from India may have to wait up to 24 years for a green card. Until you get a green card, it's a, it's a really challenge. Uh, you're not assured that you'll get a green card and you'll live in this country for long. And as Raj came to find out, the H-1B road to citizenship that promises untold opportunities is also filled with plenty of pitfalls. During his first assignment as a contractor for Sun Microsystems, he says he found out his paycheck was roughly half what the other software engineers were earning. You talk to someone there who's making $120,000, $20,000 20, K for a year, then you start comparing yourself and seeing that, hey, I'm, making, I'm doing the same stuff as this guy, but I'm making 50% less than what this guy's making. That's when you start thinking about, uh, hey, do I need to work for this company or do I need to move on? But moving on, was easier said than done. Losing a job would also mean Raj would lose his H-1B visa sponsor and his family's legal right to be in the country and risking their chances for citizenship. Ready, one, two, three, go. One, two, three, four. But Raj got very lucky. He managed to find another job, which eventually led to a great position with eBay. A year later, the pioneering tech giant officially sponsored Raj and his family for a green card. It's raining. But just after Raj had finally made it over the hump of the H-1B journey, the reality of the Great Recession hit. Raj was laid off. At the time, uh, if you watch the news, every company was doing a layoff. Everyone was doing a 10% layoff, 5% layoff. And I was part of a 1600 layoff. That means 1600 people are on the street looking for a job. And that was only one company. Now, one of the best and brightest who'd bet everything on the American dream was suddenly just another casualty in a sea of unemployed tech workers. Without a job, without health insurance, and in danger of losing his immigration status, Raj was walking on a high wire without a net. After sending out hundreds of resumes, Raj says he only managed to land eight interviews and not a single job offer. I thought I, I was a good fit, I thought I did well, but still I couldn't get a job. That means there's someone in the market who is uh, very much uh, like me, having uh, maybe he's a bit better than me. That's why he got a job, I didn't get a job. He says the search process drove home a stark reality. In today's world of global business, even the best and brightest talent are liable to become expensive and expendable. Maximizing short-term shareholder value means Companies are always vying for new talent. The fresher, the cheaper, the better. They only uh, think about their uh, numbers because they have to prove to their uh, sh stakeholders on the numbers every quarter. If you are having someone in the company for 20 years, you, you might be paying him a lot, lot more than a fresh graduate who can come in, uh, do the same stuff, get trained for three months and do the same stuff in half of what we are giving to this person. Why shouldn't I hire two people rather than hiring these people? So I can understand their mindset, but uh, that's how the competition is right now. But meanwhile in Washington, business groups have continued to push Congress to increase the flow of high-skilled foreign talent coming to our shores. Making the case at a recent hearing in the House of Representatives was Bo Cooper, policy counsel for Compete America, that's a coalition of leading H-1B employers such as Microsoft, Intel, and Cisco. If we're to attract the bright minds from around the world that will help U.S. employers keep jobs in this country, grow more jobs for U.S. workers, and remain the world's innovation leaders, a robust and effective H-1 program is essential. Essential, even though, according to industry data, the great downturn left upwards of 200,000 tech workers across the country unemployed. How many of those people were working on visas or green cards is anybody's guess. Raj did eventually find a job, a position as a software engineer with Verizon. But he says getting laid off forever changed him. Now nights and weekends are spent at the computer learning new coding languages making sure he keeps his skills sharp. He says he knows that regardless of where you work or where you're from, 
the era of job security has given way to a contest of survival, and workers can never get too comfortable. There was a time when uh, people used to join a job, uh, even uh, if I look back uh, to India where my father, he did, in his whole life he did only one job. He went to a job, he retired in the job. Uh, it's a, like a personal advice to everyone uh, out there uh, is uh, don't assume that you will be going to stick up into this job for long. Uh, don't be surprised if you have a pink slip uh, standing on your cube. Next day you go into a job. It has been very difficult, Raj says, seeing so many of his American friends and colleagues out of work. First of all, uh, I am sorry for them. When I talk to that person, I, I very much felt sorry because this could happen to anyone. It could happen to me. Today I have a job, but I could be in a similar situation. I might be a citizen at that time, and I could be in a similar situation, so it could happen to me also. You have to practice, right? Um, I practice. Despite all the uncertainty, Raj says he's still hoping to get his family permanent status, move into their own house, and make America their home. But if, for whatever reason, their high hopes collapse here in the U.S., Raj says he's prepared to go where he needs to go to support his family, wherever the work may take him. It's all part of a brave new world of work. Clearly, it's not just American citizens who are struggling to compete in today's job market. We've talked to other H-1B workers across the country who say they are increasingly finding themselves displaced by foreigners brought here on other visas. Every year, companies are importing hundreds of thousands of visa workers on an alphabet soup of programs that have fewer rules and less oversight than the H-1B. We're going to continue reporting on this issue, and we want to hear from you, other visa workers and citizens out there. Tell us about your story. Send us your comments to viewer at hd.net. And that's our program for tonight. From New York, for HDNet, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. If you'd like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at viewer at hd.net. Kind of like wondering, you know, did you resist, did you protest? I did at first, you know, I, I pushed his hands away, I, I, but I never really questioned it, you know. I was raised to believe that I'm supposed to trust a priest, I'm supposed to listen, you know what I'm saying? This is the person I go to confession and tell all my sins to, so how can this person be doing something wrong? What's notable about this case is that the Los Angeles Archdiocese assigned Father Lopez to work with the children of St. Thomas the Apostle in 2001. That was a time when the world, and the Vatican itself, was coming to grips with the unimaginable scale of decades of sex abuse by Catholic priests and cover-ups by their superiors. In Los Angeles, the church was, at least privately, acknowledging it had a problem. In March 2002, an explosive series of articles in the Los Angeles Times detailed widespread priest abuse in the archdiocese and ultimately forced Cardinal Mahoney to address his parishioners. We acknowledge our mistakes and our role in that suffering, and we apologize and take responsibility for too often failing victims and our people in the past. Cardinal Mahoney has since become a central figure in the sex abuse scandal. As a bishop in Central California in the 1980s, he had shuffled known abusive priests from parish to parish. 
and under his leadership as cardinal, the Los Angeles Archdiocese agreed to pay more than 500 victims a record $660 million. The following is an HDNet original presentation. Tonight, all is not forgiven. Shocking revelations of a priest's dark past and the lives he shattered. Could it all have been prevented? The Archdiocese knew that they should not believe the word of a potential predator. They should always err on the side of protecting kids, and that's something they did not do. Also, plastic, plastic everywhere. A vast sea of garbage lurking in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. We're just now really starting to delve into this in detail, and we have no idea what the long-term effects on this ecosystem have been. And a brave new world at work. The high-tech job crunch from the point of view of a foreign worker. I'm doing the same stuff as this guy, but I'm making 50% less than what this guy's making. That's when you start thinking about, uh, hey, do I need to work for this company, or do I need to move on? We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Reports. Good evening from Los Angeles. When the priest's sex abuse of children scandal exploded nearly 10 years ago, the Roman Catholic Church promised a new era of no tolerance. Perhaps no one was publicly more contrite than Cardinal Roger Mahoney, who until recently was the leader of the Los Angeles Archdiocese. But tonight, a Dan Rather Reports investigation reveals new evidence of a disturbing gulf between words and action. As it turns out, while Cardinal Mahoney was promising sweeping new reforms, his archdiocese welcomed a priest with a dark and not so hidden past to this parish. As a result, more lives were ruined. This is not make-believe. You know, it's not something I made up. It's not something I woke up one morning and, and, and decided, okay, today I'm going to say I got molested by a priest. This is something that took place. This is something that affected me as a child and it's going to affect me for the rest of my life. This young man is listed as John V.G. Doe in a lawsuit against the Los Angeles Archdiocese. He asked to remain anonymous because of the nature of the crime against him. As a teenage student at St. Thomas the Apostle Catholic School just outside downtown LA, he was repeatedly molested by a popular priest named Father Fernando Lopez Lopez. Well, tell me how you first came to know Father Lopez. I was going to St. Thomas the Apostle School, you know, and I had seen him around a few times, you know, and I met him, I actually got into contact with him in confession, during confession, that's when I met him. Did you like him? Yeah, he seemed like a nice person at first. I know how difficult it is to talk about what most people would consider unspeakable things, but when did you begin to lose trust in him? You know, uh, truthfully, when we were driving around and he started, uh, touch me where he wasn't supposed to be touching me, you know? That's when I started, I started. By Cardinal Mahoney, ignored or disregarded several warning signs about Lopez's past. And why was Lopez placed here? Uh, well, uh, the community here is actually primarily El Salvadoran, mm -hmm. large El Salvadoran population. Um, so being from Colombia, he spoke the language, uh, he knew the culture, and for that reason, I believe they thought he was a good fit for this area. The complaint alleges that Lopez had a history of abusing boys in his care before he ever came to Los Angeles and was able to continue because of a, quote, conspiracy of silence. Finaldi says that other than knowing that Father Lopez was a priest, the archdiocese did not do nearly enough to check his background. He showed up unannounced with no letter from his bishop and he said, hey, I want to be a priest here. And that's really not the way it works. Well, wait a minute. Help me help the viewers understand here. Sure. He shows up in this archdiocese 
in effect on the doorstep? Yes. Saying I'm a priest? Does yes. he have credentials he can show? Or? Well, he had some, uh, I believe he had some paperwork, mm -hmm. you know, but how does the archdiocese know that the paperwork's accurate? Mm -hmm. Our position is the only way to do that is either to send someone to where he was from and inquire as to his training, or to receive his actual records, his seminary records, his personnel records, or to at the very least call someone on the phone and talk to him. And they didn't do any of these. The story of Lopez and his abuse of teenage boys extends far beyond this hard scrabble neighborhood. To understand why this case is so explosive for the Los Angeles Archdiocese, you have to travel halfway around the globe. Welcome to Tivoli, Italy, just outside of Rome. This is a close-knit working-class community. It should be noted that some of the victims had been molested long before Mahoney's tenures as cardinal and bishop. When the cardinal retired in February, he and his archdiocese were the subject of at least two investigations. Lord, protect us in our struggle against evil. Still widely respected, indeed revered by many Catholics and others for his good works over the years, Mahoney has never been charged with any crime. There's no wiggle room. I, I can't take a chance that someone uh, who may have been guilty or was guilty may uh, uh, abuse a child again. I can't take the chance. But even as Cardinal Mahoney was assuring the public that the church now had a zero tolerance approach to abusive priests, at St. Thomas the Apostle Parish, those assurances did nothing to stop Father Lopez from preying on teenage boys. Lopez was eventually arrested and in 2005 convicted of molesting John V. G. Doe, now 22, and two other minors. The priest served three years in prison, was eventually stripped of his priesthood, and in 2008 was deported to his home country of Colombia. But our investigation has uncovered disturbing new evidence that Lopez should never have been entrusted with children in Los Angeles. Even if you're hiring a janitor to work in the school, you're gonna find out where he worked, who he worked with, you're gonna fingerprint the person, you're gonna do a background check. They did very little checks on this person, this Father Lopez, and for what reasons I really Attorney don't... Vince Finaldi is representing John V. G. Doe in his lawsuit against the Archdiocese, set to go to trial in October. Finaldi's client alleges that Los Angeles church officials led